Yarn, welcome to The Body Movement. Thanks for having me on. It's Thanks good to be here. Us. Um, very cool to um, have somebody like you who's kind of in the public sphere. You're doing TV spots. You're on Lex Freeman's podcast. Yep. Um, you're on some prominent stuff and uh, you were just nice enough to connect over social media, be responsive to my notes. Um, it's just uh, very cool to see this podcasting space and people that are kind of out there uh, willing to help others that are kind of growing. Sure, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting space and, yep. uh, it, you know, it's becoming more and more influential. It's becoming bigger and bigger in terms of the, the number of people watching. And uh, I think it's great as an alternative source of opinion, an alternative source of news, alternative source of media. It's great. Yeah. Does it, uh, I mean, does it align with, and for our, our listeners, they'll, they'll know you better than us even probably, but for your <laughs> listeners, like being an Anne Ryan objectivist individualist, do, do, are you encouraged by the growing of the podcast market and all these opinions um, with the downside of, you know, there's not fact checking as much. It's, it's just anybody, me and my sister, we just started this. We hook up a couple mics, uh, get the webcam going and who's to say we're an expert. So it becomes harder to, you know, filter all this stuff, but more ideas are out there now. Yeah, I think it's great. I think long term, there has to be a filtering mechanism and, and the markets will evolve one, I think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, it, it's a tragedy that, that we've lost kind of the mainstream media as some kind of, as a news, objective news source, because uh, we need that. The fact is right. that uh, most podcasters can do reporting. They, you know, they, they don't go out into the streets and report about the news. They don't fly to Ukraine and tell us how many tanks are really on the border and what's really going on. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really crucial for all of us, for civilization, to have an objective media source. Uh, opinion is relatively cheap. Yep. <laughs> uh, facts are hard to get. The, the, it, they require real work and they require real ability. And, and I think we're going to miss um, the old New York Times, if you will, or the old, yeah. I mean, even the old New York Times was pretty biased yep. and, and, and pretty bad. But, but the idea of the New York Times, the idea of somebody going out there and, and getting the news and reporting it and bringing it out. But once that is done, once we have this basis shared source of information, objective information, yeah. it, it's fabulous that we increase the number of people expressing opinions about it, uh, maybe even expanding the availability of news because they're bringing in local information or specialized information. Yep. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it's great to see. And it's, it's, I, think, I think this is going to flourish in the future. I do think there will develop mechanisms to produce factual information in order to filter kind of to, to fact check who, who, who are the good guys and who are not. Yeah. I've, um, I've hit the wall with institutions <laughs> and it's like, it's why we started our podcast. Like not, not only with the news, but um, education and healthcare and finance. Uh, the reason we started this is if you go on in the health and wellness space and healthcare and physical therapy and pain management, there there's a lot of, flashy accounts out there doing cool exercises that aren't good for people that speak to the wrong audience and they get likes and they get the views. And so, you know, my, my sister here, who's just an expert in PT is always, always fixing something with me. Like, Hey, my, sure. my shoulders messed up, my hips messed up and she, and I'm, I'm doing this. And she's like, you're just way off base, dude. You're just way off base. So it's like, no, it's no more like, do you know the basics first? Like, right. Why? I don't mind sexy and flashy, but can did you, if you can't hold a plank, why are you doing this? So, and I, and as we've gone through the podcast, I think that's what we've seen across the disciplines is this loss of the foundational principles of everything to the sexy marketing. And, you know, how do you counteract that? And, um, you know, how do you counteract that when the basics are not sexy for anything? Well, uh, that, that's the risk that you run by opening this world up to anybody who, and anybody who can, who can come on and say, I'm an expert on diet or I'm an expert on fitness and follow me. And this is, while you might be tired of institutions, we need them. Right. So this is the role traditionally of institutions is to say these guys are quacks and, and here's some objective knowledge about it. And they might not always get it right, but but they they're at least trying to get it right. And and uh, and, and, and people learn to respect them and to use them as guides. But the fact is the institutions around us 
uh, crumbling, uh, you losing credibility. And as a consequence of that, we're going to need new institutions. Right? The solution is not, in a sense, a free fall. The solution is new institutions that have reformed the existing ones. Yeah. Uh, th- there's no easy. There's no easy way out without creating alternative institutions to what we have today. Yep. So I want. I definitely want to touch on that. Um, but to kind of just keep it a little lighter here in the beginning, too. Uh, new institutions, because in, <laughs> in, in a way. Uh, that I, that is what Allison's doing in her field. And I want to see how you yeah. see it kind of going globally. Yeah. Uh, just want, I want to, I want to do the, the cliche stuff though. Um, you're participating in this market. You're highly opinionated. Yeah. I've listened to you. Uh, I, I came across you on Lex as I'm sure many people did. I'm sure that's yeah. elevated you somewhat. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm so opinionated though, that it, it elevated me and reduced me at the same time. Right. <laughs> Right. Well, hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people now hate me um, right. As, right. as a few tens of thousands like me. And that that's the balance, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and that was, that was my and like and that was my question. You, you, you you're on national global uh, TV sure. shows, opinion shows. Sure. You're in you're on public debate stages. You mm-hmm. go on a show like Lex, who has over one to somewhere between one and five million followers and you get hundred thousand views. And you're talking about Ayn Rand. It's. Um, now you're putting your ideas out there. So how has that been for you now that we, you know, we're talking about all these opinions out there, you're one of the, you're one of the guys doing it. And how is that tension? How is it? Um, do you, are you, have you become more grounded? Have you become uh, more inward introspective and in looking at your ideas and, and being like, maybe I'm off base on some of this stuff? Or are you like, geez, this is, uh, I just got to take a step back, evaluate and, um, and repurpose, reword the way I'm communicating this to the market so that it's not such a hot debate. It's more of a conversation where you're trying to educate people. Well, I hope that I do that to a large extent. You know, it's, I it, think it, you have, yeah. and, and there was a sense in which going on Lex is very different, let's say, than, than what I used to do, you know, 15 years ago when I used to go on, I don't know, Bill O'Reilly or some of the Fox show where you have three minutes and 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 you want to lob as many bombs into the into the thing over three minutes because that's right. how you can get people's attention. That's how you rem- they'll remember you. That's how they'll follow you. And of course, in those days, there was no mechanism for them to follow you. Maybe go to a website, but right. you know we know now how 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 much websites suck at really attracting <laughs> yeah. uh, attention. Social media has changed that. It's completely revolutionized the way in which we market ourselves and the way in which we can engage with people. And and social media is a huge positive revolution in that sense, in spite of all the all the negatives um, associated with it and the negatives that people hear about it. I, you know, so that has morphed into a kind of you know. I was shocked first time Lex approached me and I said, "Well, how long is the interview?" I thought, "Okay, an hour, right?" right? Yep. Which is which is kind of a kind of standard. I, I had done um, uh, Dave Rubin. And Dave Rubin had this format of an hour and that had, you know, yep. hundreds of thousands of views. So, I, and then he says, no, you know, we'll just chat for three, four hours. And it was like, <laughs> what are you nuts? I, you know, how, how does that happen? Yeah. And yet the beauty of Lex and, and his ability is that he, he just lets it flow and, and he's a great interviewer and the three hours go like that and you right. don't even pay attention. And of course, I love that format. It allows me to take very controversial ideas instead of lobbing bombs out there that provoke and create cognitive dissonance, right. we can now walk through a whole argument. We can now discuss it, uh, yeah. and debate it. Yep. And, and uh, you know, I've been on this show now three times, uh, twice with other people yeah. with kind of a back and forth, which yep. I think uh, also helps. So, yes. so, I, so I love the format. I can't say that it's changed anything about me or about what I do. This is, of course, this is, more natural in a sense that I've always preferred the long format to a short format and, yeah. and the, you develop the skills you have to as a public intellectual develop the skills to address uh, either one whatever is thrown at you if somebody called me up today and had me on tv for three minutes I could do that although it's a lot less fun than sitting down mm. with somebody like Lex and, and having yeah. a conversation yeah, it, it, it's really cool. And it's encouraging as like me and my sister, and we're a much more niche market. We're talking about injuries and pain management, healthcare. But you watch a show like that on YouTube and it's three guys 
sitting, talking monotone at a kitchen table and people, I watched all four hours of you and uh, Michael Malice. Um, yep, and a I lot of people did. Yeah. And I didn't, and I didn't even realize it was going by. So it's encouraging that um, some feedback that I got some, from a couple of people else, you didn't know, this is our pod. They're like, your podcast is kind of boring. Like you're just sitting there talking about plantar fasciitis for 45 minutes. I go, yeah, but somebody's going to watch that. There's a market for it. Uh, we got to hone our skills and get better at it and uh, et cetera. But um, the fact that somebody can watch just three people talking at a table about something like that, and you're getting hundreds of thousands to millions of views, I think is a sign in the right direction that the market is starting to do that filtering that you're talking about. Yes. And, and look, it filters in the fact that uh, Lex has 1.4 million followers or whatever the number is today. Yeah. Um, it, but it filters in, in all kinds of direction, right? Uh, you know, Joe Rogan has, I don't know how many people, 20 million people, um, uh, you know, and some of his stuff is good and some of his stuff is crap. And, and that's, that's true probably of everybody, yep. but, uh, the market is, what's interesting is that in a, in a, in a world of short attention spans in a world where we've been told, I remember being told over and over again by marketing people, Three minutes. Everything has to be three minutes. You know, yeah. do short videos yep. that suddenly four-hour videos would generate hundreds of thousands of views. Yep. That's shocking. It turns the paradigm upside down. Yeah. And that's a good thing. So, so the fact yep. that the culture is eager to embrace long format discussions, debates, maybe, you know, maybe the next uh, revolution will be people will start reading again. Yeah. Well, that's what I... <laughs> By the way, I that would be huge, I, and but that's that's where I'm at in my uh, my intellectual journey. Kind of well, started. There is for- no intellectual journey without reading. Sorry, yeah. people out there in podcast land, but if you don't read, you're not doing an intellectual journey because the 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 pacing of reading is completely different than the pacing of talking. When I, I read, I, I can slow down. I can read a paragraph twice. I can underline. Yep. And it, it, you know, it's just like. Uh, movies are not the same as novels and uh, the experience of reading a good novel yeah. is, is deeper and more profound than any movie you will watch because it's so much more conceptual because yeah. it takes longer because you live in that universe, not for an hour and a half, yeah. but for days and sometimes weeks if the novel is long enough and powerful enough. So uh, slowing down in certain aspects of our lives is a good thing because it, it allows us to go deeper in yeah. terms of the knowledge that we're acquiring and the experiences and experiences that we're acquiring. Yeah. I wonder, you know, like in, in this journey or what, you know, everybody's journey in the social media and the books and where, you know, how we're flowing is, I almost see it as a journey of, of, of learning to be non-judgmental again. Like, I feel like everything has been like, so not, and not being, you know, having your opinions and being judgmental, but at the same time hearing things. So like a four hour conversation with people who might disagree with you and have different opinions is, you know, stepping back and hearing these opinions and digesting them. Like almost like you were saying, reading the paragraphs versus just being like, no, I don't like that. Yes, I like it. No, I don't like that. Like hear it, see it, feel it. Where are people with that? One of, you know, one of the um, people in the healthcare system that I follow a ton was like, He had a great post the other day that was saying, you know, I used to make, you know, be very judgmental of people's exercising and what people were doing with movements. He's like, but now we know there's this huge inactivity crisis and nobody's moving. So thankfully these people are doing these exercises. They might not be the best, but at least they're doing it compared to 80% of Americans that aren't. So, you know, instead of putting these people down who are trying to make a difference, let's let's make everybody rise to the top and not judge people so much and and not be so polarized by the opinions i guess more so than let's hear each other and make a shift together as a as a culture versus you're right i'm wrong this is what it is that's what it is Um, yeah i think a lot of this (laughs) i think a lot of this has to do with what it means to be judgmental Uh, we have too many people in the culture have a tendency to judge emotionally and to judge on the moment and the instant and from a soundbite. Mm. I'm all for judging. We should judge everything. Yeah. But judging means, I think, to be thoughtful, considerate, take yes. into account all the evidence, yeah. all the facts, and then make an evaluation. Judge yeah. To judge is not to instantaneously, 
oh, I, I, I have a negative emotion about this. It must be bad. Your right. emotions are often wrong. All of our emotions are often wrong. Yeah. So, so emotions are not tools of cognition. They're not mechanisms by which you judge. So we should judge, but we should judge rationally. And mm -hmm. indeed, we should everything we do should be rational. And what we see is we, we're, we live in a culture which is dominated by emotion, yeah. dominated by gut, by whim, yeah. uh, by doing whatever I feel like doing and whatever I feel like, you know, and judging based on, on emotion. I, I'd like us to move to a judgmental culture, but where the judgment, the source of that judgment is thought. Yes. And that can be fast. You can't judge people fast that way. You have to listen to them. You can't judge an argument without understanding the argument, uh, listening to the argument. So I might say that is a horrible, evil argument, but I better know what the argument is before I say that. Right. 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 And, you know, I, I, in that sense, we need to slow down. Yeah. And, the, and there's nothing wrong with saying something's evil if you've thought about it and put it. When one of my friends asked how I got you on the podcast, I said, I just emailed and asked him. And then jokingly, I put dot, dot, dot. And I said, uh, and I told him I'm sick and tired of communist. <laughs> so it's just like, yeah, and I, like do it. I mean, I'm, I'm very open to, to being on people's podcasts because, yeah. you know, you have a different audience than I do. You have a different audience than a lot of the other podcasts I do. Right. It's a great way to, to just engage with new people and to be exposed to new people. And, um, and so uh, believe me, there are a lot of people who hate communism that I would not go on their podcast with them. So, right. Uh, right. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so now that like we kind of talked through that market stuff, I'd love to get into, so I, I've recently, I ha I've had Ayn Rand's books for, for many years. I, By the I, way, it's Ayn. Ayn. Ayn, 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 Ayn. Ayn. Yeah. I'm a, I always, I've, I, tomorrow I might've been saying tonight, today I might have been saying Ayn and then tomorrow I would say um, Ayn. So yeah. Um, in, in any event, I've been reading her, I, I've read her books in the past year. I've I had them for many years. Again, your, your appearance on, on, uh, Lex with uh, Michael Malice kind of turned me on to that in your first appearance too. Um, you said, you know, reading her stuff just kind of made sense to you. Like you, you read it and you didn't know what was kind of off in the world and you read it and you're like, all of a sudden it kind of hits a little different. You're like, yeah, she kind of touched on that stuff. Um, our podcast, the, the body movement and B O D Y stands for built on developing yourself where yeah. own your health, Take yep. it back. Don't be reliant yep. on the healthcare system. Yes, we've made great advance in medicine, but they're monetizing our illness these days. Uh, the, in, the food industry is kind of a little bit corrupt and incentivized to market. So you know, we're, we're saying the way to compete with this market is to uh, build new institutions with, with the way Allison's doing it, stepping out of the healthcare system, building a cash-based practice where she just offers, it's, mar it's capitalism, it's free market. Come see sure. me, no health insurance. So this this idea of individualism, objectivism is attractive to me. I, I think I'm kind of bought full, almost fully into it. I'm still exploring it. Sure. Um, have, have you seen, um, again, you got a lot of, uh, you said you got a lot of elevation and a lot of hate um, af after your first couple appearance on Lex. Um, have you seen it? Is it split 50, 50 on, on getting these ideas out? Um, is no, it, I mean, clearly, clearly it's, uh, it's 80, 20 with 80 people hating and 20 liking at I'm least sure. maybe 90, 10. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I, you know, so I go on Lex, maybe uh, on the first appearance, I get a thousand additional followers yeah. out of, I don't know, 300,000 people who, who, yeah. who viewed it. Yeah. Right. And then viewed all the clips and all that. Right. So I, I'm getting a tiny fraction. The same thing happened with Dave Rubin. I'm getting a tiny fraction. It's it's better than nothing, but yeah. I, I'm not convincing 80%. I'm not convincing a majority. I'm not even convincing half of the yep. people who hear me to investigate further and to, and to want to, to do more. Um, no, you know, look, what Ayn Rand offers and what I uh, try to promote are ideas that go against the mainstream, against everything that people believe in. In the deepest parts of their psyche, that is, it's not just a different business proposition yep. or, or, or a different even political view. It's a different view of, 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 uh, of the world, about the purpose of your life, yeah. about morality. And, and that is a real challenge to people in terms of uh, uh, their, their ability and their willingness to, to engage. Yeah. And... Um that's just crazy to me. And, and the, and then 
and then you know recently uh, in your most recent one with uh y- your rom uh you yeah. you, know, you you mentioned uh you know that you you are kind of feel like you're losing this battle of uh preaching this stuff so i don't know I don't know how you, how you see this, but is is the way to keep doing it is just to keep appearing and talking about it is the way to kind of preach this message. Does, do you, is it building a better community? Um, it's something I think I'm on board with and I want, cause I want more of those debates to keep happening. But um, if, so if, if there were a thousand people like me or who agreed with me, who, who are, who are committed to being public intellectuals or committed to bringing these ideas into the public, I think we would win. Yeah. It's a numbers game to some extent, right? I mean, I, I might piss off 80% or 90%, but maybe somebody else arguing the same ideas would do a better job or appeal to a different segment, or if they hear it in different voices from different people repeatedly, it would have an impact or for the those of people who are out there who are just followers, maybe they just become followers because, hey, a lot of people are saying this. Yeah. So it, there is a sense in which it's a numbers game. Uh, part of my job is to help train more people who can do this, who can who can get out there and, and articulate these ideas. Yep. Um, it takes a long time to change a culture. Yep. It, it, it's uh, particularly when you're trying to change it fundamentally, you're challenging the fundamental beliefs of the culture. Yep. That's going to take a long time and it requires yep. a lot of work and a lot of effort. I, it, you know, you need to write, you need to speak, you, you need to communicate, any form of communication. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping that over the next few years, we'll have writers, we'll have speakers, we'll have, all, you know, social media experts, we'll have people, podcasters, we'll have people out there who are taking Ayn Rand's ideas, applying them to their particular area of expertise and, um, and just, and just spreading the word and getting people engaged and getting people interested. Yep. That's how, that's how we reverse the trend. Uh, but we are losing. There's no question. I mean, all these other ideas, yeah. socialism is on the rise, nationalism is on the rise. Uh, you know, the, the, the alt right, the, the old left, the, the, uh, nas- you know, the, the new right, the new left, Right. All of these ideas, because they don't challenge anybody in a deep, dramatic fashion. They're all just variation on a theme, and people can easily uh, engage with them. Uh, what I'm doing is asking people to really, really, really question their most fundamental beliefs. Yeah. I, I Go ahead, Al. No, I was going to say, you know, the, the, the fundamental beliefs and uh, the technical term that uh, we throw around sometimes is, I don't, not you and I, Matt, but in some of the groups I'm in, is just a mind fuck. <laughs> like, I, it's just yeah, I mean, all that, the time. Uh, it just to call that cognitive dissonance, right? Just to call <laughs> that cognitive dissonance. Great yeah. dissonance in people's minds. Yeah. Uh, and that's hard for people. People like to be in groups. They like to agree with other people. You ask mm-hmm. them to think for themselves. You're asking them to have opinions that are different than everybody else's. And, yep. and part of it is you have to model that. You have to model that it's okay to think differently, that mm-hmm. you can be successful and think differently. Yeah. And, and uh, But if you get a large, enough pe- a large enough group doing it in a variety of different fields from you know education to health to physics yep. to, to a whole array of these, yep. then you slowly start chipping away at the culture. Yeah, and that's... I think, go ahead, Al. Sorry, I got one more thing. Is that, you know, like how you... In, Chipping away that culture also comes down to, for me, like doing that with my kids. Like my daughter came home the other day and she's like, mom, am I different? And I was like, yeah, you're damn right. You're different. What, right. you know, what's wrong with that? And, and she's like, well, I don't know. I just feel different. And I was like, explain to me, you know, and, uh, you know, ask me like some deep questions about being, di- she's six about being different. And I'm like, well, what, it, does it bother you? She's like, no, I like it. I was like, great. She's like, are you different? I'm like, I hope so. I'm like, I hope I'm different. I hope people see me as a weirdo. Like I want that. And, um, you know, I wonder, you know, and and I don't, I have no idea what goes on in other households about, you know, like, oh, fit in, do this, do that. Like, do what you, what do you want? What do you want? Because I'll help facilitate what you want, not what I want or what. A lot of people are conventional. A lot of people are followers. A lot of people train their kids to be conventional, be like everybody else. Yeah, uh, be be like the standard, uh, and and weirdness and difference and standing out is frowned upon. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. my parents were like that. My parents did not did not like that you were different. Did not like the kids being particularly too smart, too, right. di- too different. Too, they wanted 
average. Yeah. They wanted to be. Yeah. Like yeah, and I just like it's funny with the with the kids. It's like you know how how do we continue to facilitate that growth through them? Um, you know, like it's to the point where you know like when we talk about school and doing homework and all that. Like yes, we're we're doing that. You know, we come home, we do our homework, we're doing our things, and you know, I, I question some things about about the homework. Like you know, my daughter just likes to get it done and throw it away, and I'm like. Okay. Is it too easy? What is it? What, you know, what's not, yep. you know, yep. what do you like about it? You know, and um, yes, we're doing our homework and handing in, but it's like, you know, you know, growing up, we were all like grades, grades are the most important thing. And now I'm like, in my head, like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know. Like, like I have kids I know that I treat that, you know, aren't the best in school, but they're awesome kids and they're doing great things. And, you know, what can they do is so far beyond like what you're, grade in school is. And, um, you know, really for me, changing my perspective on that from the way we grew up and not saying, I don't want my children to succeed, but it looks different these days than it did 20 years ago. And how do we keep up with those thought processes Yeah. other than having conversations and reading and developing our own judgments, if you will. I mean, I think that's the only way to do it. I mean, the, 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 the work is hard work. It's, it's about reading and thinking <laughs> And, and having conversations and engaging yeah. with the world, not, not shutting yourself away from the world, but engaging with it. Yeah. And, and again, to, and to your point, um, like you said, you're chipping away at this stuff, at this messaging and yep. like the way we're doing it with healthcare is again, I I've said this on like four or five podcasts with our, with our, with other physicians and experts we've had on, but like I've, I've thrown in the towel on healthcare. Like I've really just thrown it, <laughs> like I've given up on it. And Allison's again, she's gone cash based, so she doesn't deal with the system and to, it ties into everything you were saying. She can just now see a patient for two hours and go deep into their history and talk and think and, and get a plan going, but they got to pay her a premium and this yep. is the market. And guess what? Her patients are getting better than they ever did when she was in the established healthcare system. So, There's no question that that's true. The, the, the challenge, of course, is how do you scale that? And you can't scale yeah. it unless you change yeah. the system. And 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 the and and this is why it's important to fight for the right ideas. And and it's not it's not about it's about fighting for freedom. It's about fighting for the government getting out of the healthcare business completely, yeah. zero yeah. interference from the government, getting rid of Medicare and Medicaid, which is pretty radical. But that what that's what it means to get the government completely out of healthcare. And then letting the market evolve. And who knows how the market will evolve, what new institutions will arise, what new payment schemes will arise. I think insurance is really, really important, but not the kind of insurance we have today, which pays people from dollar number zero, or the kind of insurance today, which is heavily regulated, heavily controlled by the government. You only can sell insurance policies that the government approves of. But imagine a real free market in it where people are offered catastrophic insurance, uh, so only, only, you know, if really something really, really bad, just like auto insurance, right? You don't pay yeah. for every little fender bender on your, the insurance doesn't cover it. They don't cover the oil changes. Yep. Uh, they pay you if like, yep. they, like the real reason to have an auto insurance is if it's a total wreck, right? If you yeah. go into the hospital, if you have surgery, I don't, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, a lot of money, right? To, to pay for something 100%. big like that. But the fact is that most things in healthcare don't cost a hundred thousand dollars. Most things in healthcare, most people can afford, and they don't need insurance that covers them from dollar zero. They can pay out of pocket, particularly if they stop having to pay into the system through you know, 50% marginal tax rates, through Medicare, through all of the stuff that the government sucks from us. Yeah. And in a free market, what happens to prices? The fact is that what happens to prices because of competition is prices come down. They don't go up. Uh, so if, if Allison faced a lot of competition, she would have to reduce prices because of the competition, right? So that, that's the reality. Yeah. Or, and, perform and that, or, or perform, perform better. Or perform better. Or something right. The incentive that, to perform better, we mean. Yeah, yep. yeah but, but competition drives down prices and up quality. That's, the, that's what happens. And, that, and, and, and that's great for everybody, right? So, uh, you know, what we need is to get government out of healthcare, but to get government out of healthcare, requires a whole chain of reasoning that goes back to yeah. a view of government, a view of the economics, <laughs> but also a view of ethics, a view of, of what is just and what is right and what is wrong, right. to a view of epistemology, that is, how do we know anything? How do we, how do we know what's right? How do we know what's wrong? How do we know what's a fact? How do we know what's... 
So yeah. the real battle is a philosophical battle in order no to fail our healthcare system, right? But that's what we ultimately need to do is, is to completely revolutionize healthcare, finance, education, education. everything, right? Everything. Yeah. The government has its hands today in every single aspect of our life, and it needs to get out. The only thing government should do is protect us, protect yeah. us from frauds and criminals, everything else we can do voluntarily between us, uh, better, cheaper, and, and more effectively. Yeah. And that, I mean, again, that, and that's exactly what I was doing. Um, and then we had a dietitian on a couple episodes ago, and she's doing her own thing in the nutrition world. And it got, it got me thinking of Atlas Shrugged and, uh, you know, Galt's Gulch. I mean, where- think about nutrition. Why the hell does the government have a food pyramid? Why is the government telling me yeah, what's already- good for me and what's not for me? And to what extent do you think that food pyramid is impacted by the uh, dairy lobby, which is pretty powerful in Washington, you'd be surprised, or by the wheat lobby mm-hmm. or by the corn lobby? We know the corn lobby is influential with ethanol, which impacts gas prices, yeah. right? So- I mean, and the sugar lobby, there's a massive sugar lobby in, in D.C., which makes, which makes, by the way, corn syrup cheaper than sugar because of the corn lobby. I mean, it's, it's so convoluted and so complicated. Yeah. But the fact is that so much <laughs> of the health advice we get from government and so much of the nutritional advice we get from government is yeah. driven by particular lobbies and particular pol- political agendas like the yeah. farm the, the wheat and corn farmers are huge because they dominate the Midwest, right? They're yep. all over the Midwest. So if you're a senator from Kansas, yep. are you going to have a negative opinion of corn of, or ethanol? Of course not. Now, should you have an opinion? Should any politician ever have an opinion about corn and ethanol? <laughs> My answer to that is no. I agree. Politicians should not have a position about food, about nutrition, about yeah. health, about yeah. diet, about exercise, about anything. Right. Because it's none of their business. That's yeah. something I take care of for myself. And I don't need guidance for a politician who has about the knowledge of a second grader right. as applied to almost any anything in life. I mean, these guys are not smart. They're not knowledgeable. <laughs> they're not well-educated. The, the, the technical term for most of them is morons. I mean, they are, they are, they are power-lusting idiots, right? And we've given them power. We've given them power. Over right. every aspect of our lives, it's the wild. only thing they should be concerned about is protecting us. And and even then, they're not qualified. We need better politicians, right? Than what we have, what we have today. So yeah. I believe better politicians are possible, but not if they have to run every aspect of our lives. If you if you ask people to run for politics, and say what's the qualification that you can run other people's lives, well, only bad people, only bad people. Are going to want that job. I don't want that job. I don't want to run your life. Yeah. I'm not interested in running your life. It's hard enough to run mine, right? But, <laughs> so why would I want that job? So by definition, you get bad people who all they really seek in life is power over others. Yep. That's uh, the job qualification. I mean, that's you know, how, that. You go ahead. That was no. I was going to say, you know, but but you know the for i mean the last there, there's no there's no question over the last four years personally like personal growth and understanding of the world and stuff like this and it's like every day is a mind-blowing day for me talking to people yeah. some of that is the ability that i have to talk to people so you know from from clients i have one runs a nitrogen gas business and i never ever would have known the connection between corn and nitrogen gas in my entire yeah. life Yep. Until I was sitting and chatting with this gentleman in my office that's there for some type of pain. And then I have a woman who was in charge um, between Ukraine and Russia about the flow of water and understanding how the flow of water is extremely political and how it impacts power. Right. And like some of these things are just mind blowing. Like I just sit there like this, like talking to people. And, yeah. and but like so I think you know the the not even ignorance but just the naivety of like of where we are of understanding the world is so hard for people to keep up with and you know the more you're exposed to that and is that through reading through reading you know the exposure to the world um, is something that I'm kind of struggling with of like how do you know or how do you even know where to look and how do you even know how to get these perspectives other than if you travel or if you do this and that? Um, because the perspective on the world drives so much knowledge of the need to maintain independence and of how you don't even realize that you're being 
control or where the power is until right. you start to see some of these things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from somebody sitting back, not quite 40, three little kids working on building a business, you know, to keep up with what the world is happening. Th this is why know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> this is why the institutions get so big, right? So important right. Because you shouldn't have to. The fact is yeah. that life is complicated. There's a lot to do. You got three kids, you've got a job, you've got, you got, you know, just a lot on your shoulders. Sure. You know, I mean, really, what do you care about what's going on in Ukraine? Right. I mean, the only reason you should care about what's going on in Ukraine is if you don't trust your political leaders and that what your political leaders might do might result in your kids ultimately being drafted into a military to go fight a war. That I mean, that's why you should care, right? Right. But if we had politicians who we trusted, if we had an economic and political system that we trusted in, then most people wouldn't care about politics, right? They'd, they'd be hunkered down and yeah. trying to do the best job that they can to achieve happiness for themselves, which yep. is fun, interesting, yep. and, and yeah. but, but requires a lot of focus and energy, right? And, and yeah. uh, so it's only because we've given our politicians so much control of our lives and so many of them are bad and incompetent then now we're going, I need to worry about my water because politicians control it. I need to worry about the food I eat because, hey, it turns out that the politicians recommended this food pyramid that is completely upside down and completely nuts and has not no relation with health. Right. Um, I need to worry about, uh, about health care because I can't necessarily trust my doctor because the government has provided him with these perverse incentives. Yep. And it's not even that he's a bad guy, but he has to kind of follow certain rules. He can't prescribe medicines that the FDA hasn't approved. He can't prescribe treatments that are not acceptable because otherwise he won't get compensated by Medicare or whatever. Yeah. So the government makes so many of the people we should be trusting brain dead, yep. just like of a mentality of following orders, that it becomes very, very difficult. Now, what you need to do in the world in which we live is yeah. develop trusted sources, but even that is hard. <laughs> and even that is difficult because, you know, somebody like Joe Rogan, who half the time it's good stuff and half the time it's complete garbage. Well, how do you tell? How can you tell which is the half that's good and which is the half is garbage? Yeah. So it's, it's that we live in a world where it's very, very difficult. We're pounded by information. I will say this. Too many people care too much about politics. Um, and are not focused enough about their own life, Agree. And about their own life better and, and improving their own health and their own, uh, yes. their own ability to, to live the best life that they can live. And yep. too, too obsessed yep. with what this guy said or that guy said. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't control it. Go Correct. live your life, make the most of your life. And, and you should worry about what the politicians are doing. But there's not much you can do about it anyway. So, yeah. so don't let it dominate your life. Yeah. And again, built on developing yourself. That's why we, this is why we created this thing, right? It's like control what you can, you can con the, at least to you have your health. It's something that's been quoted a thousand times, you know, a, a, a day by, you know, society. It's a common phrase. Um, that's kind of our message that I think scales across all the institutions. If you can, if you can manage your own finances, um, which is a whole another thing. But if you can keep a budget, if you can save more than you spend, if you can take care of your health, if you can eat right and you feel the best, now you can make a, di a dent in maybe your local community. And slowly, I, and again, what, what I wanted to get to at the beginning of all this was, you know, you said we need a thousand of you kind of preaching this stuff and chipping away. I don't think in our lifetime and even me, you know, my, mine and Al's that we're going to see anything material change but can you get it from a one to a four on the one through ten scale can you get it from a two to a six um in at least in your little communities and hopefully that that allows that scaling to happen that you were like that you were mentioning like how do you get it to scale um by building those little communities in your own networks and hopefully that forces the institutions to compete with the success you're having maybe yeah, I mean, what, what, what we need to do is, is a slow the yeah. deterioration away from liberty and freedom and, 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 and rationality towards irrationality and, and authoritarianism, and then start reversing the trends. But, but both of that, is, that, both of that is, is difficult. Right now, the battle is to slow our descent into authoritarianism, because that's where we're heading. Yep. Um, yep. And, and I fear that that's, that's where 
that's where this country is heading. That's where the world is heading. Um, and then uh, and then reverse it. And that's going to require a lot of work and a lot of effort by a lot of people. Yep. And 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 it's and it's it's encouraging because some of the guests we've had on in the health ex, the health experts are going cash based. We did have a farmer on um, who does uh, natural bison farming. Um, they don't get certified USDA organic. They actually just write an affidavit on their website. We're better than organic. Here's everything we do. You can trust us or not. And yeah. they pass that savings of not having an official come out and expect and you know inspect their farm yep. and pass that cost on to us. And they're like, you can trust us or not. And then they've built a distribution network with other local farmers that don't do bison, that do poultry, that do elk, that do rabbit, and say, we have the distribution set up. We'll buy your stuff at a premium so it doesn't mm-hmm. get lumped in with the industrial farming because then it just goes to waste all your hard work. Something like that was really encouraging to hear. We had her on a couple episodes ago, but you know, again, the scaling is like, okay, we got to amplify that and, and inspire people to step outside and do it. And then it becomes scalable because it's decentralized. I think. I mean, my, my view on that too is, is it, it, you have to be careful not at the same time to demonize industrial farming, because the fact is that industrial farming feeds the world. And, and yes, it's not ideal. It's not the optimal diet, but it's, you know, people are living, longer. you know, we'd love them to live a lot longer, but pe- life expectancy has doubled uh, over the last 150 or so years. Uh, people living better, healthier lives than ever. Yep. Um, and not if we can afford uh, kind of the, the, the optimal diet. So uh, it goes back to uh, Allison's point about better to move, even if it's not optimal, than not to move at all. Sure. It's better to eat, even if the food is not optimal, than not eat at all. And, yep. uh, and uh, you know, generally, I think technology can help us uh, improve the quality of our food, improve the quality of our uh, yep. of, of what we consume. Uh, we don't have to demonize technology while promoting, let's say, better food. I, I, sure. I think that's a dangerous trend among kind yep. of uh, people who advocate for organic or so on. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then, um, and again... It was just it was just encouraging where they weren't necessarily demonizing and they uh, the farmer, the bison farmer, she did give credit to the produce industry and and organic does mean more there than it does in the meat industry. And um, they can do that at scale. So there, there was there was some good stuff that came out of that on both sides. Um, good. But, it, you know, again, the, the regulations around it, the, the fact that having that certified organic by the USDA, she's like on meat products, it doesn't even really mean anything doesn't even yep. mean anything. So there, there's definitely that fine balance that we totally, we totally get that. Um, and again, you mentioned that you've, you're seeing, and we, we all are, we've all said it on the podcast, we're, we're seeing this in finance and education and healthcare um, and other institutions, probably even the prison system. And you just like, you could go on and on um, yourself being in finance. Um, you got to be going, you got to be just, kind of throwing your arms up these days, right? With everything. I, and I got my MBA in finance. And again, I know you, you're you managing your portfolio probably pretty well because you understand all the constraints, but there's probably too many constraints. Yeah. Um, I mean, the constraints are ridiculous and they're only growing, but look, nothing's really changed in a fundamental way in finance for a hundred years. I mean, uh, industry's mm-hmm. always been regulated. Yeah. We've had a central bank since 1914. Yeah. Uh, we've had the FDIC since 1933. Or yeah. 34. Um, you know, the, the, the government has always had a heavy hand into finance because of how important finance is and how significant finance is. So, um, yep. you know, it's, it's, it's getting worse because the more it does, the bigger it grows, the more you, uh, you overlay regulations over regulations over regulations, the more uh, hazardous it all becomes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you find, like in any other field, you find a way to navigate all that and to do the best you can within the constraints that are being placed on you. Yeah, for the, for the common, for the, you know, the, the average American trying, you know, raising a family of three or um, just coming out with a little bit of student loan debt. Um, you know, I think the wealth gap that's been mentioned is a real thing that's, that's happening. Um, and but you should never worry about gaps. Who cares about the gap? The, okay. the only, I mean, so some people are richer than you. So what? Of course. I mean, good for them. Yep. The, 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 what's important is, 
are you being rewarded for the for the additional productivity that you provide? Uh, yep. Right? Are you are you being rewarded uh, in in proportion to the productivity? And then the other question is: Is the gap um, a consequence of productiveness of people producing, or is the gap a product of government manipulation? And that's and 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 that, of course, is a question. Right. And it's not clear to me, right? I mean, would the gap be bigger in a free market or smaller in a free market? I don't know. I don't care. In a free market, I don't care about gaps. All I care about are, uh, am I being rewarded for my productivity? And do I see a path for me to get better, to, to, to achieve things? Uh, you know, the challenge today is, uh, if, if you know, what do you do with your money, right? The challenge today is you're trying to raise a family. You're trying to put away some money. You, you want to send your kids to college. You want to save some money for retirement. How do you do that? When interest rates are zero, when the stock market is all over the place, yeah. when uh, when inflation is 7%, right? Yeah. I mean, money sitting in the bank, basically you're losing 7% on that money every, every year that you have it in there. Yeah. Um, how do you manage your finances in a world like this? It's very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, the only way to do it is to take on risk. But then if you take on a lot of risk, there's also downside, right? Risk means downside. Yeah. So, uh, so sometimes you get clobbered. To me, that's the challenge. But uh, yeah. we focus too much on gaps and too little on opportunities. I agree. The real question is, do you have an opportunity for betterment? Do you have an opportunity to rise up? Do you have an opportunity to save money for your kids? Are your kids going to be better off than you are? Yeah. If you take the right actions and if they take the right, right actions, those are the real questions to be asking. Yeah. And, and I, I, ref, I referenced the gap because of when you isolate all the variables out, I, I, I am of the opinion that some of this regulation, some of this centralization, some of this printing money and quantitative easing um, is, is benefiting the people um, that you know, are already kind of well off and puts a few more hurdles in, in front of the common joke. Um, it's not that they don't have the opportunity. It's not that they can compete in this market, but, uh, to your point with all these other institutions, it's a few more regulations of devaluing a currency where the person at the bottom of that, that, that is going to strive for something, um, yep. doesn't have the assets that are going to appreciate at a rate that's going to allow them to compete at a level over time and generationally that's that isolation. I don't. And again, I don't know if you look at that um, at your firm too too much, but it, that that's where I I start to look at. Um, and I know I know you're not a big uh, from your podcast with Lex and uh, Malice. That you're not you're not the biggest like Bitcoin guy, but that's where I see maybe something like that at least provides a little bit of a hedge against this system. Of where you look at what's happening right now, Bitcoin's down 50%. It is, yeah. um, it, you know, so it's not a hedge, it's actually it's actually worse than the market. If, if you own stocks, you're down maybe 10%. If you own Bitcoin, you're down 50%. So, yeah, you know, I think it's very dangerous to sell Bitcoin as a hedge, it's a speculative asset, it might go up, it might not. Mm -hmm. Um, you're taking on a huge amount of risk and a huge amount of volatility. Yep. And some people are going to make a fortune, have already made fortunes off of Bitcoin. Sure have, and yeah. other people are going to lose a lot of money, right? I mean, if you got into GameStop uh, uh, when it was a meme stock uh, at the bottom and you sold at the top, yep. you did great. But if you held it all the way till today, yeah. you didn't do great. You lost a lot of money. It, what, uh, GameStop is down over 50% yeah. from last January, right? Yeah. So it's it, it's... You know, the no, this is the, I, I think an important point is the no get rich quick schemes out there. I agree. You could, some individuals get rich quick by chance because always lucky people, people win the lottery. Yep. So people bought Bitcoin to some extent by accident at the right time and sold at the right time or whatever. Same thing with GameStop or whatever. But over the long run, there are no get rich quick schemes. Uh, the question is, is the system rigged against you? And I think, unfortunately, the system is rigged against most Americans today yeah. because it's very, very difficult to save. It's very, very difficult to invest. Yeah. And our politicians are constantly, and the Federal Reserve is constantly manipulating the system in ways that make it much more difficult for the average individuals yeah. to be able to confidently save and invest for the future. And, 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 and that's a challenge. And that's a real challenge. Yep. Um, and and with your firm and your expertise, how do you um, how do you what what is what is that little chip away um, 
activity that somebody something that we can do so again in the intellectual realm it's read more write more introspect think watch a four-hour podcast take some yeah. notes at research in health it's take the time out of yourself in 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 the financial world what is that like little mini step that somebody especially like the younger kids coming out of, of college is like what's that little mini step is it is it the same principles that we've been that our parents have you know just say just stash away and save um where where can they where can they put that long-term plan into into place? you know it's very difficult but this yeah. is what again institutions are important financial advice is a good i think i think young people going out there and uh and speculating um and speculating uh then that's not the solution. That's not how you're going to get successful in life. What you need is a steady long-term program. Uh, and, um, you know, a steady long-term program really means, uh, it, it means having a diversified portfolio, not day trading, letting experts do their job and uh, not pretending that you know how to invest because you know, I don't know, physical therapy, right? You're an expert in physical therapy. I wouldn't try to do that. Why are some people pretending that because they read a few posts on Reddit, they can now compete with me in finance? I'm going to eat their lunch. Yeah, and, and 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 that's a reality. And over the long run, they're going to lose. I'm going to win. And yeah. so, uh, but it seems like in certain areas like finance, people think that you can be an amateur and, and, and you can win. You can't. You, you, you've got to develop the skills or you got to hire experts to do, again, institutions to do a job. If I need yeah. uh, my body improved, I need to go to a physical therapist, a, a trainer. I need, a, I need to get, I need to buy expertise. The same thing for a young person coming yeah. out of college. You want to start saving. Then you've got to, you, you, you know, you maybe hire in the manager. beginning, you don't have enough money to, to hire a financial advisor, but at some point, You've got to get advice, maybe, uh, or at the very least, take a finance course. Uh, right. But don't try to be a day trader. Day trading is for suckers. Agreed. Day trading is people, professionals like, uh, not maybe not like me because I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not opposite day traders, but professional, uh, professional investors, people who are pros at this, yep. love day traders. Yeah, yeah, because it's you know you make money off of them. Yeah, um, this has been this has been. Uh, <laughs> Just so there's just so much to think about, but uh, it's really it's it's great to hear. I I'm a proponent of your message. I um I'm I'm still investigating and, and researching and, and reading more of Rand's work. Um, I love the idea of everyone investing in themselves and pursuing their selfish interest that doesn't cause harm to anyone. Actually, does build up the collective. Um, it seems like all these things that we talked about today, it's like, if you just start with yourself, if you just start with your family and, and you're not causing malice to anyone else by doing it at their expense, um, it's a way to make these institutions slowly deteriorate. I don't, you know, I don't see a way to go right at them. And it, that it feels like that's the way ver versus worrying about politics and debating with your family about nothing that matters. Yep. Um, just kind of taking a look and, and understanding your own values. If it, it feels like, um, it feels like that approach makes the most sense, but, and it's just really interesting that um, all the feedback you get from your recent appearances that seem to go against it. And is it just because of it's attached to, to rant? Do you think if, if you weren't preaching her work that you, you might be received better? Um. I don't know. Maybe I think in the United States, there's a negative attachment to Rand. I, yeah. I think that's certainly the case, but I don't think it's just that. I think the ideas are radical yeah. and, and people have a hard time with them. That's just objectively true. In other countries, there's less of a attachment that's against Rand. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I, but even there you get resistance. So I think it's overall just a radical message that people have a hard time getting their head around. Yep. I, yep. I think, you know, like tying like some of our other podcasts and like we had a we had a sex therapist on. Right. Yeah. And the whole thing about that was in sex therapy, it's getting to your deepest, darkest place, like talking about yep. you and that's not comfortable. And we're not 
um, and I don't know if it would be something we're educated on or like, but, but the comfortability with your deepest, darkest self. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about from the, from the foundational principles on whatever scheme it is really comes down to confronting who you are and what you're doing. And I think there's, in my opinion, there's nothing more scary to people yeah. about who your deepest person is. <laughs> yeah. Yaren did a whole, uh, a little whole segment on uh, sex a couple of weeks back, just like, oh, yeah. hey, you should buy I, I end up often talking about sex. It's something that obviously interests people and I have opinions. So what the hell? Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah. yeah. But, it, but it, the, it, the deepest, it's darkest this, self, I think, scares people, you know, in whatever realm. Well, and not all of us have dark, right? Do, dark. <laughs> sure, you know, sure. Dark is, the deepest up? places. And suddenly, Allison's tipping her hand here. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> and suddenly, you know, one of the things we need to get away from in the culture is that there is a, there's a yeah, certain right. orientation that we get from religion that sex is dark. Let me talk about sex. Sex is amazing, beautiful. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, the darkness comes from the fact that people are so repressed about sex. They can yes. talk about sex. They feel ashamed about sex. We get that from religion. We need to abandon all of that. It's, 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 it's uh, um, you know, anyway, yeah. that, you know, that that's what we need to, uh, it's part of this agenda is, is to get it right. Yeah, and, I love and, that. And you're, you're, I like the the calling me on the darker spot because I like sometimes Matt will say things and I call him out. I'm like, but it's not that. It's not dark. It's beautiful. There's, you know, and that's the same thing. Like, you know, for people in mental health to be, to be able to talk about that freely. Like, most people have some type of mental health. Like, it's not a, it's not even an abnormal. Like, it's a normal. And yeah. how do we flip those abnormal things to being normal? How do we change it? You know, in the sex world being uncomfortable talking about sex, but our kids are comfortable playing games where they're shooting people in the face with guns. Like what, like, yeah, I mean, what I, makes I've sense always about this stuff? You know? We're far, much more comfortable with violence than where we're ah, set. I mean, crazy. violence should be like, oh my it God. It boggles my mind. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. Yeah. With, you know, and it's okay to idealize gangsters, but, but if, you know, but, but sex is somehow, yeah. you, you know, yeah. it, it's completely insane. It's completely crazy. And, and, yeah it goes back to how we educate our kids and, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and, and what the culture is all about. Yep. Yeah. But the, um, that move of what is, what everybody thinks is abnormal is actually normal findings and in back pain, 80% of people have lumbar disc herniations that don't have symptoms. So why is this an abnormal finding? And you know, how did we get so far away from yeah. how, how is an 80% finding abnormal? How, sure, how is sure. that an abnormality? And, sure. um, yeah. you know, so again, a, a kind of across all those institutions of flipping what, you know, what we hide or what we've been shown to oppress versus like, no, yeah. this is reality and this is yep. who we are. And this is, yeah. you know, yeah. issues for many or, or not even issues, beautiful things for many in, in many cases. So Absolutely. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, Yarn, thank you so much for, um, coming on the podcast. Um, this is, this has been great. I think, you know, it, it, and it's cool to talk about all these problems, but you know, along the way talking about little mini solutions we can take, I think is uh, what we're built on. And, um, Absolutely. well, it's always fun to call politicians idiots. Cause I love doing that myself. It, it is, yeah. it, and, <laughs> and, it, and when it's true, but it, it's, um, it's always inspiring to hear somebody who, who, you know, does see hope through uh, um, doing what you're doing and, and putting yourself in the spotlight and sharing your ideas. Um, maybe, maybe we have you da back down the road when I've continued to hone my intellectual um, ideas and maybe challenge you on some of the stuff. But I, I good. I'm, I'm open to, um, I'm open to these ideas. And, and um, thanks for uh, spending some time with us today. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks for having right. me on, everyone.